We're live. Well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Um, what a what a time warp and uh, weave it is here. Um, I'm Sandy, you know, and your host of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, and I'm on the phone with you, which I've never been before, um, because for some reason the trickster energy is hard at work with my computer here, where I'm joining you today from the east coast of the United States in Old Saybrook, Connecticut, which is where I hosted throughout most of the winter of 2021, um, looking out on this beautiful vista today. Um, I am so excited to welcome all of you for who are watching us live um, from the Zoom room uh, in your beautiful squares where I'm not seeing your faces today. Um, and of course, to those of you also watching us live from Facebook. I know everybody has access now to so many readings and particularly as we kind of enjoy that excitement of venues, uh, at least in the United States have been opening up to live readings. So I certainly appreciate um, uh, you joining us here on, um, on Zoom when, and hope that you can get to an in-person reading also very, very, very soon. Well, it's incredibly gratifying to be able to bring our new book showcase back to, back to Connecticut and um, um, back to, back to Connecticut. We are very, very excited to be able to help people launch new books, especially and then some people who are on the cusp of having that first book, that we know they're on the cusp, which will be the case of our first reader today, for whom when I heard him read said, gotta have Ken Holland on the program, who's been working on a first collection. Um, so really excited to have you join us for the new book showcase and where we're able to provide this virtual venue with an enthusiastic audience. And I hope that you'll consider you know, purchasing at least one collection today from um, Teresa or Bob, uh, both are quite accomplished uh, poets with numerous collections. A reminder to all of you that the chats are live in both venues, in Zoom and on Facebook. So please send all the love to our writers. Well, first up today reading, as I mentioned to you, is Ken Holland, who, if, if you've had a chance to hear Ken read, you'll know why we wanted to have Ken featured here on Cultivating Voices, live poetry, uh, because he is an award-winning poet, um, just as I said, on the cusp of that first book. Ken Holland has recently received both a second and a third nomination for the Pushcart Prize. And he's had work widely published in journals like the Tulane Review and Southwest Review. You've heard Ken on, um, you've, you've also seen Ken in Rattle, again, one of my um, favorite journals. And if you can take in the Rattle cast that Tim Green does, and he's been in a whole host of anthologies. When you Google Ken Holland, you see all kinds of ways that Ken has participated in literary citizenship as a poet and also as a reviewer of poetry collections. Ken has um, forthcoming publications or are just recently out in Tar River, Confrontation, the Louisville Review, Crosswind Poetry Journal, the San Pedro River Review, the American Journal of Poetry, Plain Songs, Sugar House Review, and Main Street Rag. And he lives and writes, and as I said, uh, is in a, just a, a, a wonderful poetry citizen joining us today from the Mid Hudson Valley of New York, would you all please give a very warm welcome to our first reader today, 
Ken Holland. Oh, wow. Goodness gracious, that was better than my poetry. Thank you, Sandy. Um, okay. uh, excellent. Um, and unlike Sandy, I can um, see many of you, uh, the, the, the faces live and the faces on the stop video, all finding our way um, onto this, uh, this particular afternoon. So really greetings, everyone. Uh, well, lucky you, instead of all poems tried and true, I'll, I'll be including a number of new ones, uh, untried and possibly untrue. Uh, we're still close enough to the 4th of July for this, this first one. It's called All the Pretty Girls. The sun's barely had a chance to grab hold of the sky, but already pounding heat into the air. Fireworks last weekend where some kid offered up two of his fingers like blood sacrifice. His friends chanting, holy shit, and only one of them with the presence of mind to look for the missing flesh, which he failed to find. It was just too dark. Maybe it's the sun slowly igniting the dawn that brought this back to me. How for all the speed of flaming gunpowder, the kid may have witnessed the event unfolding like a first kiss, where time breaks down and lingers, blind to its own intent until pain snapped on like neon and shock lit the kid's skin in pale yellow fluorescence. It took him 16 years, four months and 12 days to hold that Roman candle the way he did. And just before it all went wrong, there would have been a space where he could have counted off 10 seconds on his fingers. And then a space where he could still have counted nine I have little doubt the heat slipping into my skin this mid-July morning is the same heat the kid feels in his phantom fingers. And how what he wants to hold on to is just that much harder to grasp against his body. The way a pretty girl will turn her head than turn it away. So I also only just realized this uh, next poem itself has a, thank you. Um, has a passing reference to the uh, 4th of July. It's called Pull the Visible World. Pull the visible world around your shoulders. I know your mother died and took her beautiful cliches with her. I know your father died and for the love he instilled, you forgave him his bigotries. Pull the visible world around you an age you thought you'd never live to, the street vendors you've come to know, not by name, yet enough to say this one is Panamanian, this one Haitian, this Mexican, Puerto Rican, Trinidadian, Guatemalan, where you buy your fruit, your cafe con leche, your empanadas, where the seared smoke from the halal car drifts around your shoulders and the Syrian scraping down the surface of the grill understands this is his movable piece of America. And America smells like cooked lamb, like ground chickpeas, like cardamom, nutmeg, cassia. Pull the world around you, pull the hours of labor, your mother's grandmother, the piecework that left her blind, your father's father, how coal dusted his lungs like gunpowder. Fireworks from barges moored along the lower Hudson, Macy's siege of the city. The kind of assault that leaves you penniless, yet still gawking at the sky. Dollars shredded into confetti to fall from skyscrapers onto the numbed shoulders of desert vets. Pull the visible world. See what warmth still holds from the sands of Ramadi, from Fallujah, Mosul, Kirkuk. Pull the world around your shoulders and feel its density as it keeps the shiny spinning projectile from entering your body. Thank you. So Tom Cotton. Uh, the berserk MAGA senator from Arkansas. I, I wanted to work him into this poem, but it, it didn't fit. So I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just work him into the title. 
Um, it's called Picking Tom Cotton from the Fields. One of these days I'm going to show up as a white supremacist and take ownership of the part of me that's a slave. I will reconstruct the belling rhyme of shackle and chattel. I will teach myself how to be submissive and obedient. And I will not tolerate me talking back, will not tolerate any sidelong glances or hint of insurrection. And should there be any disrespect, I'll take myself by the neck and squeeze till I haven't the breath to even name what I am, master, slave, and will bury myself beneath the black loam of this land. And by God, I'll have taught myself a lesson then, a lesson buried by my own hand. I realized when I, I went over this before the, the reading that uh, I think there's still some, you know, pandemic, um, uh, you know, effect that's just make, made me pull all my dark poems out today. So getting it out of my system. So no doubt everyone remembers when uh, Notre Dame caught fire a few years ago. Uh, this is called Fire and Faith. Why is it we're so drawn to destruction? Do not misinterpret me, but someone slide over a lawn chair so I can lay claim to a layman's view of the burning of Notre Dame. I do not take pleasure in this, but they're lined up along the Seine, watching. This is what we do. We share the silence of grief like a spoken commodity. Because we can afford to. Because we're not among the destroyed. Because we're not dead black children in a dead black church. The synagogue of gunned down Jews the blasted faces of holy Texas parishioners. We are not them, not yet among the betrayed. Prayer itself brought them together. Prayer itself betrayed them. I'm not accusing God, but for the love of God, there was betrayal. I'm not saying the burning doors of worship ever kept the faithful out. I'm saying the burning doors are what trap them within. Uh, so let me break this up a, a bit with a, a very short poem. It, it's written after the style of, of Tom Hennon, if you're familiar with his poetry. All his poems actually that I've ever read are short and they tend to mix um, like metaphorical nature with uh, philosophy. Uh, so again, very short, it's called Thoughtless. Night is tethered to the dock. The wind has risen just enough for the night to sway, to pull taut the line, then turns to float upon its back, careless and unconcerned, as if what lay between the lake and the stars wasn't its own immensity. I love his work. I wish that was... <laughs> Um, I, wish, um, I wish I met up to his own standards. Uh, this is called Breach. You're blowing black smoke out back of the car, the tailpipe like the thick nib of a fountain pen scrawling its toxic signature across the sky. On the right, you're passing through one part of the Western Apache nation while on the left, corporate America is looking to blast away all that heritage to get at the copper that lies beneath. The same copper that comprises the very wiring running up to your headlights. How all that illumination is sourced in the scarring of something sacred. And you know little enough of your own God, let alone someone else's. And when your mother asked you, do you believe? You said to her, in what? And was sorry for the sadness you brought to her eyes years ago. How the only indigenous claims you have on this country are the bodies you've buried beneath it. 
white skin, black soil, headstones that themselves claim baseless ownership to the land, though the names could never be chiseled deep enough to last. Everything returns to the earth, no matter what we pull from it, no matter how much the machinery digs into what's buried. Nothing lasts except the kind of myth you're not entitled to, which you couldn't possibly embody. Myth is ambiguous as the black smoke blowing out the back of your car. All that darkness burrowing into the darker breach of the night. Thank you. Uh, this is called Layers. Camus wrote, if one could only say just once, this is clear, all would be saved. But I don't think that's true. I believe that kind of clarity would be lethal. Why else do we apply layers of pastel and oil over the skin of our thoughts? Why else are we our own brushwork? When I speak to you, I am first speaking to myself. I'm trying to make myself palatable. If I strip myself down to truth and laid it shivering at your feet, you tell me which one of us would survive. Let me be clear. When I talk about survival, I'm not including truth. Truth could care less. No, I'm talking about you, whether you'd survive. I'm talking about me. If in stripping myself down to the clarity of truth, there'd even be anything left to bury. So I have um, this next poem and a very short one um, to end. Uh, so and let me take this good moment um, of my 15 minutes uh, to thank you again uh, and all the all the, all the good smiles and the, the silent hand clapping. It's wonderful. It's called Flight. I hear the night driven semis and I'm counting them in my head like they were part of one great flock, as if warm blooded with a four chambered heart. Migration is no less valid for machines than for wildebeest or the displaced. I don't know why dawn doesn't come, just what its problem is. Someone must have thrown some leg irons around its feet. Turn migration inside out and you get the word shackle. Someone somewhere has compiled the number of birds that streamline their death each year into the flashing beacons of power grids all those false moons that are meant as warnings, but only to our species. Shackle any species and there is no migration, though no one's yet counted how many migrants have been walked back in shackles, bound at the wrist. Take a look at the shape of handcuffs. They're just another Mobius strip. Birds disoriented by human light send out flight calls that pull in other birds. The way a person drowning will grab on, will grab another person's arm and pull them down to where air is too scarce for a wing's panic. Have you ever tried screaming underwater? What rises to the surface makes no sound at all. How is it? that an albatross bears the curse of being a burden. Think of the way it navigates the ocean, how it spends the first six years of its life without touching land. Show me the migrant who wouldn't want to be attached to a 10 foot wingspan. Show me the migrant who doesn't understand flight. Thank you. Oh, okay, and here's, here's that, uh, thank you. Here's that, that very short poem. It's called Taps. 
Imagine God tapping at the window with one fingernail, gently. Isn't that a lovely image? Maybe then he can put down the sledgehammer. Thank you all. It's been a treat. Thank you, Sandy. It's been great. Looking forward, looking forward to, I think, I'll let um, to Teresa or Bob might be, whoever's next, bring it on. <laughs> Wonderful, <laughs> Ken. Wonderful. Fantastic. Oh my gosh. What, what a great um, overture to the rest of the reading, starting out with those, those fireworks. And, you know, I think as poets, we are, we kind of are drawn on uh, a number of us are drawn to destruction, as you said, um, in, uh, in your poem, Fire and Faith. And as you also said, you know, we, we share that, that silence of grief and, and, and I think we also break that silence when we come together for these readings. And so, um, I hope everyone can appreciate how when um, when I heard Ken read on caps, I you know why I was so drawn why I was so drawn to the poems and eager to have um, him join us. Thank you so much. I look forward to the next time I can actually see you on the screen. <laughs> and um, but it was what it's been, but it's really wonderful to just also listen, deeply listen to the poetry without, without, I have to say, without, with, without looking at the screen. Um, I'm actually truly enjoying um, the reading in a, in a new provocative, prismatic way. So thank you everyone for affording me this opportunity to listen to poetry today. And, um, so Ken Holland opening us, uh, opening up the reading today, um, so so uh, wonderfully and eclectically with with your uh, distinct voice. And um, uh, again, I look forward to having you back on um, the program again. Well, our next reader is is uh, is is not a stranger to cultivating voices, live poetry nor to um, many of the other fabulous reading series that you all have, that, that, that many of you have attended um, so, um, you, know, you know, just so, re so respectfully and so devotedly over, um, over the course of the pandemic. Um, I first, I remember the very, very first time hearing uh, Teresa Galleon read at the Cactus um, Reading Series out of Albuquerque. And, and as with Ken, I was just very, very um, struck by the power of her voice, the, you know, the absolute clarity of vision and message and image and you know, that first reading led to me hearing her read from her poetry and then from what is now her new collection, The Sense of Love. And I never, ever, ever tire of from hearing um, her voice or her poems or just from being in a Zoom room with her remarkable energy. And here is the more formal biography. Teresa Galleon is a seeker on a journey to unfold spirituality in this present lifetime. My friends, you will hear it in the poem. Writing for her is a absolute spiritual exercise. I know today she's joining us from Taos, where she's um, in community with other poets. And true to her biography, her passions are traveling the world and hiking the mountains and desert landscapes of the Western United States. 
literally and figuratively. The land is certainly sacred and her and and also serves as her spiritual temple for reflection, quiet contemplation. Here's something you may not know about her. She is an avid tree hugger and tree whisperer and has published four books of poetry, Walking Sacred Ground, Contemplation in the High Desert, Chasing Light, uh, which was a finalist in the 2013 New Mexico Arizona Book Award. And as I mentioned, we will be hearing today some from her latest collection, Fence of Love. Would you please welcome Teresa Gallian? Thank you so much, Sandy. It is really, truly an honor to be able to be a part of uh, this reading series. And I always enjoy hearing all of the new book showcase readers. And I am reading from a little city called El Prado, New Mexico, right outside of Taos, New Mexico. So I'm, I'm here with my wild sisters. That's wild outdoor women. We are a group of I women. I love it. Say hello to the call for me. We meet every year for the last nine to 10 years for our annual camping and retreat. And we hike and play and have a good time. And that's what we're doing now. Right now I'm freezing to death in the theater in this mansion that we're staying in. We, it has to stay cold for the rest of the house to cool up. But it's a beautiful setting anyway. I'm gonna start with a poem in honor of my parents because the anniversary of my mother's death is coming up next month. And I've made great strides in my grief period. This poem is called Mom and Pops. I cruise by the house to eat mom's cooking. She is happy beyond reason. From the living room window, I see him stroke my car windows with love using the morning paper. Those windows sparkle, spit shine, love glittering. I see mom out the corner of my eye with a smile from seventh heaven, watching me watch Papa as I eat her greens and cornbread. Pops has magic hands dipped in holiness and mom has hands of grace. No one ever could compete with a love like that. What we need. Our souls already know each other. When I think of you, my heart flutters and I long for you beside me. When I look into your eyes, I melt like snow into our pool of desire. When I hear your voice, I can barely breathe from an overflow of our joy. We echo the same love notes that need release to the universe. There is just one thing left to do, explore our bodies in new light since we have learned so much from many past lives apart. Merging. The full orchestra of my heart plays for you. Sitting here in the river, what bliss is the sound of water flowing from your lips crushing me? The water rolls over my feet like a melody from your touch. I want to cuddle you here in this river now, merge with the water, bind my thighs to yours, swim in the reflecting pool of your body and feel your presence all over me. Wrap me in your bosom and when I look up, your eyes make love to my essence, causing an orgasm from my delicate flower. I want to hold on to you and swim to Nirvana, emerge naked, wet 
as one in eternity because I surrender to your love. Sacred Feminine. The Sacred Feminine sends the blood and releases the tensions of the goddess. When the blood comes, know that thou art woman and the womb is sacred. This portal of holiness is ready to open and release the blood. The womb gives birth to masculine and feminine energy. We praise the womb for the gift of the sacred life of flesh enfolding soul for a ride on the earth plane. Only the awakened may touch the thighs of the sacred feminine and experience the elixir of ecstatic love. The well of love goes deep. We must pass the physical to reach the ultimate realm of the ecstatic womb. Climbing into ecstasy. She wandered through the colonies of physical love, tested the branches of desire. None held her up. Her soul cowered in a fetal sadness she tried to ignore. Today, she finds herself in the presence of the beloved who touches her forefinger. Her soul steps out of the fetal curl, moves toward the approaching light. Her body tries to resist, but the pull of love beyond the physical is impossible to reject. The first time her heart feels the pull of love, she surrenders. Her soul floats in love's light, climbing into ecstasy. Earth love call. Mother Earth made love to me. She kissed my lips with laughter. She shed tears to soothe my shoulders. She opened my eyes with a beauty massage. She allowed her trees to hug me with unconditional love. She commanded the clouds to dance for me to lift my spirits. On the bank of the river, she held my hand, giving me courage to let go and walk in God's house. Mother Earth made love to me. I stand in reverence before her as she pours the rain of rapture over my head. Forgiveness. We walk two miles with silence. Clouds hug the trees, gray veils try to smother you, and I laugh to hide my anger. The glass of vinegar you fed my garden causes enduring ripples of broken flowers. We walk today to seek healing in the forest. I hesitate to hold your hand as I question my readiness to forgive. You stop suddenly and howl at the trees. The wolves answer back with divine lyrics to ease your pain. My eyes perk up, attentive to something bigger than me. Arms open to wrap you in warmth. My heart's garden feels the boost of letting go. Flowers raise their heads like a choir ready to do a praise song. Forgiveness flows like a river in us. New beginnings often run deep in the woods. The crackle of pine needles is music to silence. A deer crosses the trail, stops, stares, 
moves on. Perhaps we can learn to live without baggage. What a boost to our love that would be. Spiritual reminder. Tears are the rain that washes my face. They do not come often, but when they do, it rains hard on my soul. When the sun comes out, all my seedlings produce virgin blossoms that flirt and sway in my heartfelt garden. These are the things your gaze brings to me. Then the wind breaks my heart in pieces, throws them toward the mountain. Light guides the pieces as they fall and land on an aspen leaf in one piece. Renewed, healed, ready to embrace love again. We all need a shake up sometimes to remind us who is in charge. I am a stubborn child and fall off the wagon daily. My spiritual guide is always there laughing on the sideline, carrying my bucket of love. Flames burn for you. The theory of fire flames across my breast. It sings in your essence, making love in the embers of your arms and legs. The burn spreads around me. I want to hold truth in my hands, wrap them around you and feel you melt into the moisture of love. Let me drown in the eternity of you across lifetimes. When you are finished with me, drop me with mercy. The rhythms of my heart will play me into a permanent sleep with your smile sheltering my breathing space. Complete surrender is the only way I may cross over to the next life to float against your light body. Everything is sacred, even the tainted must heal with a new coat of earth rubbed against its face. Now, you must be told, only grace lives in my garden. I want you, but cannot take you there. You are not ready to embrace holiness. It is still beyond your range of understanding. Everything you do must be in preparation to receive the sacred touch of divine love. I want to nourish you with my love embrace. Reach out when you're ready. I am here waiting for you. And the last piece I'm gonna read is from the beginnings of the next book that I'm working on with the working title of uh, spiritual unfoldment, which goes into my deep introspective side. Uh, this piece is called Starting Over. I am bound to my beliefs for as long as I cling to my safe zone. My mind and body conspire holds conferences, makes plans to keep me in chains. It is my choice to stay or leap beyond those boundaries and search for clairvoyance. Walks through blinding fog, test the fear monitors in my tattered garden. I smell muted ashes that kill stories, trees store in winter solitude. A broken promise in flames destroys the history lessons that seek me in spring. There is no turning back. The past becomes a stolen memory hardwired in the summer heat. Just a piece of a lesson 
survives after the fire's bitter taste creates chaos in a burned out mind. Soul whimpers in the comfort zone, reaching for a helping hand. Starting a new painting is the only way in to get outside again. Thank you so much. Wow. Well, of course, I, I can't wait to, you know, listen to the new work as it continues to emerge. And, of course, how to be able to hear you read from The Scent of Love and so many of those poems that really take as you said in an early in one of the early poems takes so many shapes and forms and to be able to be to be able to listen to that journey of divine lyrics as it moves through and with all those shapes and forms is just quite it is quite an is quite an experience uh, I'm, I don't. I don't know if, if if Michael or Anthony Ingram is on the call today, um, but I, I keep thinking of the that you know this 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 thing today has allowed me to experience what he calls quintessential listening. Um, that's the name of the program uh, that 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 he hosts, and to be able uh, to hear that absolutely kaleidoscopic uh, sacred experience of what embraces and braces um, from love is, is really, truly amazing. Thank you uh, so much, Teresa. And of course, I look forward to <laughs> seeing you the next time we're together. Well, our final reader for today, uh, again, uh, I was really, I was really, I'm really, I'm really thrilled um, to, to um, welcome Bob because now, um, you know, Don has another pal from Pittsburgh in, in the room uh, <laughs> with him. And, uh, and I, I'm just, I'm just so thrilled to have, um, Bob's voice and poetry that has been like so committed through throughout the career of publishing, um, you know, book after book uh, of the first full length collection I'll talk about and, and the latest book, but also devoted to the art of the chapbook and to, um, you know, publishing the individual poems, you know, just that way that putting collections together is really like climbing, is really like climbing a ladder. You know, it's one poem at a time. It's one rung, one, you know, one rung, one hand, you know, reaching over uh, the, each rung until you create, um, until you create a collection. And I, I'm so excited to hear the, the, the movement of of the the way that the poems move in in Bob's latest collection, Fountain. Well, here is um, Bob Wallachie's formal biography. Bob Wallachie has work has appeared in over, well over, fifty journals, including Pittsburgh City Paper. Fourth River, Stone Highway Review, and Red River Review, again, obviously among many, many others. Bob is a push cart and a best of the net nominee and has two published chat books, A Room Full of Trees from Red Bird Chat, Red Bird chat Books 2014 and The Almost Sound of Snow Falling from Night Ballet Press, which was 
nominated for the 2016 list of books for the New York City's Poets House. If you've never been to the Poets House, what a great um, resource that is and congratulations on that nomination. Well, Bob's first full length collection, Black Angels is available from Pittsburgh Six Gallery Press and the latest collection, as I mentioned, the new book is Fountain, which was just released uh, earlier this year from Main Street Rag Press. And we've had a number of folks who published with Main Street Rag and what a great job, obviously, those editors do in finding um, voices of just a clarion, exciting poetry. And so here we have another with us today from the great city of Pittsburgh, one of my favorites in, in the US, as well as one of my favorite publishers, Main Street Rag. Would you please welcome Bob Wallachie and his new book, Fountain, to Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you, Don, for having me. Um, it's quite an honor, and I really wanted to thank you for um, being such a generous host and for all the guests here for their generous and really um, insightful comments on all the readers' work today. It's been kind of a tough year for a lot of us, for me personally. Uh, a lot of good, some good things and some not so good things. Uh, I lost uh, a dear friend, a wonderful poet, and a wonderful person this year. And I'd like to start off with an elegy that I wrote for her. This is called, If You Were Here, for Barb Dahlberg. You would have mentioned the crocuses poking up in my neighbor's lawn as if from nothing. You would have remembered the ornamentals in my lawn, their lushness, before their end of season cut down. It's early spring but the air is frozen into my bones, my wind whipped face. But you wouldn't have mentioned winter or the hair you've lost, what's happened inside your body. Today, for some reason, I wanna tell you about the possum I stopped for, the one I missed with my car on the way to work in the dark, of the cat I saw on the way home, dead, frozen in a half scream in a stranger's yard. There is nothing beautiful about death, just this space between air and a reason to keep going. If you were here, I'd ask you what that is. Perhaps there's an answer in the periwinkle planters that adorn my house, the cardinals that have come back to the mimosa branches as if they've forgotten something, something so important. It's worth staying here, worth searching. So I'm gonna read a new poem, another new poem. Um, in addition to being a poet, some of you who know me uh, know that I'm also a plumber and I work in the building trades and I've written a lot about those experiences. As a matter of fact, my book Fountain has a urinal on the cover. <laughs> so, um, you know, in the tradition of um, Philip Levine, I write a lot about work. Uh, this is one of those poems. It's called The Fluttering. I'm stumbling out of the dark and back down again, winding out of the rutted valleys of the lawn, ass crack of the world, in broken roads, past AJ's crane and a hundred other rusted necks, reaching for a sky I never wanted to know. Exhaust blowing fog into a morning, the shade of bruise and regret, passing lane headlights flashing slow like tired ghosts. No one here will ever say they never wanted this life. Only this flare of sore wrists, the years of twisting pipes, diving into the dark of underneath of bleakness. In every way, this is an act of disappearance, but this muted morning 
The men from Local 27 are chatting about the weather woman's breasts. While outside, the air is losing its memory. A rash of embers, flaming lights around the corner by Irwin Iron, where steel is burning and the men there breathe it in. But today, I've made it here again to this five-story building to crawl under another dirty sink into the wrecks of leaks in ceilings where confetti of rust rains into my eyes. We're all one day closer, the 64-year-old plumber tells me. And I think about my father, the same age as me, and a year away from his last heart attack, the fast flutter in the center of my chest as I stand atop a ladder, peer into the dark above a wet wall, click my flashlight on. Uh, right before the pandemic, I recently got a job as a plumber again, uh, working at a hospital. So I have a, a couple poems about um, that experience. This one here is called Fires. 9 p.m. in the psych ward, and I'm passing through keypad doors, a tape sign that says, elopement risk, be cautious. And my mind drifts to forbidden love and that Robert Browning poem. But the only light here is lunar and cold in room 3311, where a woman ripped the outlets from the walls. We've removed her, nurse says. I've never seen anything like it, to do that with your bare hands. I'm smoldering, thinking of her fingernails, one wedged like a coin into the drywall, of my own hands seared raw with solder burns, the steel stud I rubbed past in the ceiling reaching for black holes. And suddenly it's natural to imagine reaching into a wall for a sharp fire. Last week on the plane trip, trip back from Florida, before we landed, before we knew we'd be okay, the plane was shaking like a fever and the sky tumbling gray into rain. And I'm reading a magazine to get my mind off this. The page opening to the article on electricity and the body. How a person can put out 2000 watts when sprinting. But how many for the sisters screaming for meds when the night took down power lines, wet roads, the hospital flashing dark, tree limbs sparking. How many for quarantines and layoffs, for murder hornets and sex? Screaming our heads off at the fish concert, guitar solos like transformers on fire. And what about the light switch at the real estate office? My mother sitting there, pen in her hand, her hair a frazzled wire. And how much for the lamplight we left on in her empty house, for driving away, the U-Haul, and the windows stripped of everything, the way the sky broke down on the way home, before the rain, all that fracturing light. This next um, work poem, before I switch gears, one of these, one last work poem, has a term in it called uh, roughing or roughing in. And for those of you that don't know what, what roughing in is, it's basically when you're built, bringing the pipes that are from under the ground into the house and installing the final drains and making the final connections. So that, that, that term appears in here, it's called passage. When we didn't know what we wanted to be, they gave us hard hats to tell us. I was yellow, color of young and dumb and full of everything I didn't know about Monday mornings in West Virginia where three months of bitter cold 6 a.m.s are enough to say, fuck the rough-ins of big box stores, hollering distance from bald knob, stretching into eagle sky country, the split earth of valleys and cattle farms and gas stations that sell everything. Here, I'll spend my whole day waiting for the cat backhoe to tear me a new one and a hole big enough for a grease trap in the entrance into hell. Three days later, I'll return to the living and blow air into my hands. Watch the 10 Mexican carpenters shoot nails into studs after crossing the border on the emergency break to build walls for the snack bar at Target. They lean shoulders into wood, speaking in the buzzsaw language of faster and do it now. 
my head inside their hive as I turn away from the pipes and keep watching song of their bodies, song of what all of us had to do just to survive another day in this needling air. I remember our foreman who called them rats, then drank coffee and watched all of us eating together from his heated job trailer. But by noon, it was warm enough to sit on the mountain of broken bricks and backfill, the sun blazing behind our heads, blackening out the shade of us until we are nothing but gesture, an arm inside a cooler to pass out bottles of water, fingers touching for a second, our hands reaching out to each other, dripping water, our skin shining. This last um, kind of a work poem I want to I want to read. Um, as I was leaving Florida, we passed by this uh, fruit and vegetable truck. I started thinking about other for other people and other and other work and the suffering of, of what others have to do to, to survive and to to make make a, a daily pay. And I did a little research on the field workers. Um, from this area, and I wrote this poem. It's called Keys. 160 miles between pavement and blossoming. Six exit lights, six exits from flight 229 leaving Tampa, past the fire wheel blanket flowers and inlets fingering the flattened brush. Gray highways bursting with roadside palms, the fruit trucks splitting the wind and carrying crates of guava pineapple heirloom and the sweat of field workers, hands over the eyes and the sons of Bradenton, Arcadia, Coryopsis bursting wild from the roadside beautification program, dove-tailed leaves, the shade of sun-washed celery, wrens, grackles, and the average birds of a hidden light of singing into the empty. Windows down, I'm waiting at a light in the morning heat at the turnoff for the tomato fields of Amokali, thinking of the heavy barrels of reds and greens, shoulder bushelled and spilling into the truck beds as the men yell pendejo or cabron at each other, asshole and bastard laughing. We pull out under a raw umber sky while small engines roar overhead, low enough to spread eagle the field workers in shade, a sheen of rain spitting its pesticides down over their heads over their endless reaching and bending. But at liftoff, the palm trees are already growing smaller under a plane's wing. Highways becoming small gray tongues as I pull up the article chronicling a day in the life of a tomato worker. 4.30 a.m. Prepare lunch in your trailer. 5. Walk to the pickup lots and wait for work. 6 a.m. Take converted school bus ride to the fields and wait for the dew to lift. Don't touch anything. Remember, you haven't been paid yet for any of this. Nine, start picking. Each bushel is 32 pounds, 50 cents worth of wages or more, depending on the speed of your picking. Well, eat fast with your hands soaked in pesticide. Return to that smoldering sun, burning the rest of your minimum wage day down. Five to eight. Wait in the pull-off for the lights, for the school bus to arrive. Take the nameless road there and drive. Stir gravel dust into the air like a prayer. Nine, get out in the dark. Drive the west rest of the way home. So as um, Sandra made note of um, me being from Pittsburgh, and I do write a lot about Pittsburgh and there's mention in here of some Pittsburgh things that some of you might not know. There's a famous or popular uh, grocery chain grocery store called Giant Eagle, which is mentioned in this poem, called Railed. Down where the steel reaches through turns, patches of grass poking through cracks. You could disappear behind hills and steal cans of Red Bull, go running the railroad home behind Giant Eagle next to shores of washing machines and beater cars, past the bluffs of mud, embankments of the Allegheny and the waters of steel, where I watched tides split the gray with its stinking darkness. 
but on Saturdays, we lift it off. From the one tree that survived the tire swing on a rotten branch and took turns pushing each other over the garbage dump hills, mattresses and smashed TVs, the reach above the rising fumes, bare legs pumping and pumping to get higher than the drift, carrying open barges, the rush and trash thick waves from runoff and waste treatment plants spilling out at sea into the deep, envious of its leaving, our row house lives, our dying fathers and struggling mothers who raised families, answered phones and scrubbed toilets, thinking as long as we lived, would never be like them. A couple poems. Um, I started writing, I family was, um, was sort of like my wellspring where I was writing a lot about, and this is a mother poem called In the Beginning. In the beginning, there were 50 foot pines and a spike plant. Our Lady of the Broken Cobblestones and a path to her house, splayed with needles and the plastic grotto she came with from Rite Aid. My mother's backyard is a pilgrimage to every dropped leaf and seedling, pizza flyers and tinsel still taped to her railing from last Christmas. I'm selling her house over the phone as I steal one last look through her sun flooded windows. The old bones of her hardwood floors visible from the street. My mother is on the other line, making time for me between Saturday mass and the domino playoffs. She's sipping Zinfandel at sunset crossing apartments where everything is becoming new again. The insurance papers she can't find, the name of the restaurant and her doctor's appointment lost in the fog of her previous life. And the one I imagined for her, I've just picked her up for breakfast at the ocean and there'll be no medications to forget to take. No questions left unsaid about her tests. How much time she has left. I've canceled my vacation, so I'm sitting at home watching webcams of the Atlantic, boardwalk traffic, and the splash of current. I lean into my laptop screen. I can feel the shrapnel of shells against my feet, fragments of bone, immaculate as cracked pottery. Outside the restaurant, as I stand up from the table, my mother is speechless, staring at the shore. She's forgotten her fear of water, so she stands with me in, in awe of the crashing wall, all that wet pulling. And we're near that hotel, the one that sits next to the kite shop with the eagle still tied off on the rail. And there's a song playing. It'll come to me just now. I can't remember. I'd like to end with a love poem of sorts in my wacky way, love poem. Um, Teresa uh, and Ken, beautiful poems. I was really, um, really moved by your, your love poem. So I want to end with this one it's called Spooky Pizza Friday. Spooky Pizza Friday was what we called it, like a holiday or good sex. Something that demands a name, leaving you breathless with sweat and at least one good cigarette. This is Friday, but even before 7 a.m., we're sending te texts. Can't wait to see you or till this is over, covert as teens or spies. Inside the pink bathroom stalls in your office, at a light changing green, where I'm replying with red lip emoticons in my pickup to a chorus of horns, middle fingers sticking out of windows, but instead of go, I'm thinking of a two topping special and the coupon I left on the, on the desk at home. The 30 minute wait at night for the passenger seat to get red hot, for the windows to get fogged up like a first date. But listen, I'm talking about food here. How the swirl of cheese slumps down the comforters of a spongy crust, pepperoni burning the cardboard air with the zest of its salts. I'm driving home from Fellini's Pizza toward the beginning of the story, where the plot is always based on true events. The road freezing, the unforgiving curves, slick patches I just miss. I can see my truck flipped over, my head against the dashboard, cracked windshield, wheels in midair still spinning. But this is the Friday I have enough tread to recover. 
spin in the harmless grass in time to make it home, the pizza is still steaming. I want to believe it's because we're so tired and we deserve the desert island of our couch. To be envious of our cats again, knitted together like scarves. Because for two hours, we can forget arthritis, the sister in the hospital, and walk into televised darkness. Follow four unsuspecting colleagues as they get together, then split back up again. Set up mics and cameras, say, make sure you get this, or is there a spirit here that wishes to speak? They listen for the whispers of phantoms on playback, and just like them, we are stupidly waiting for the mist of special effects. The deep voice bellowing get out into a night darker than the time I was 18 and shaking in my bed. Old enough to tell a shadow or an open closet from the shape of a father who never came back. No footstep, no banging pipe mistaken for, I miss you, we'll get over this. In the movie, it's the crucial moment of discovery where we are always pausing for bathroom breaks and another slice because the story is so bad it's good. And who wants to see anyone survive it? The dead jock, the cheerleader panicking in the basement, witnessing something so terrible no one could possibly believe her. In the end, the priest never says the right thing. The stained glass shatters into screams. The evil is always bigger than he is. Some monsters he'll say never leave, but we don't think about this. We hit play again and lean in together, waiting. Thank you. Wow, what a what an absolutely just gorgeous poem to end with from a just a really just solid, solid set. I love how in your work, your work about work was full of all those objects, but also you use the word gestures and the the gestures of work. Um just just so like inhabiting and embodying um these poems of such like specificity and yet like like opening like our world to just you know understanding understanding ourselves in a really in, in a different way than I thought about myself and work before and you know you began by talking about um really how there's nothing uh, in that first poem, that, that elegy, there's nothing, you know, beautiful about death. And we've, so many folks, we've been surrounded by it, um, whether up, up close or, you know, through the lens of the pandemic and other global events. And I really was struck by, while there might not be anything beautiful about death, the one thing that we have that, that, that helps us make it palpable and to create something beautiful out of it, of course, is poetry. And um, you certainly did that today. I can't, uh, I can't wait for, for you to return, what a what a trio of poets we've had today on the New Book Showcase. We began with the first book seeking <laughs> Ken Holland. Again, can't wait for that collection. Teresa Galleon, and we just heard so poignantly the poetry of Bob Wallach, Wallachy. Folks, even though I'm on the phone, I'm gonna prompt you all to feel free to unmute yourselves and just give a round of, of applause that our beloved trio can hear in appreciation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you. Great poetry today. Heartbeat. Yeah, I, I just heard Max. <laughs> I think I heard Max. <laughs> How are you doing, Sandy? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I wish I could say hello to each one of you, of course. And I, I have no idea who's there, but I recognize Max's voice. I want to, again, thank our three readers today. Um, what a what a wonderful what a just again I I really love the triangle that you know each side of humanity that you brought to our consciousness today, uh, folks. While I'm just sharing some final remarks with you for the afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are, uh, feel free to put in the chat if you have any upcoming readings or announcements um, to let folks know about those in the chat. I hope everyone will join us next Sunday um, as we continue to move through that fireworks display of July offerings of poetry from Cultivating Voices, live poetry. Next Sunday, uh, what I love about the new book showcase is, as I said, it can bring together so many so many themes in dialogue with each other, and we don't know what they will be. They're always a surprise, and yet the poets always are speaking, um, you know, to each other in some in some unique combination. Um, but next week we head back to our poets' focus, where we look at a theme um, and and focus on that and include the live open mic. And so next Sunday, I hope you will join us for what I think is gonna be a quite unique uh, poet's focus on the theme of translation. So we actually, we have six poets who are being featured. Kim Ports Parsons, don't panic. I have the names to share with you <laughs> for our promos. But we have six poets who are translators of diff from different languages. We'll be hearing from Peter O'Neill, who is um, a who is a translator of uh, Baudelaire. So we'll be hearing some French um, from Peter. We'll be hearing in the in French in the original French and in English. Nina Kaufman will be joining us with poetry. Um, in translation from Russian. Carolyn Tipton will be joining us with some poems, her translations of, um, of her beloved Spanish uh, poet. So we'll be getting to hear uh, many, many languages. Kankuri Sinha will be joining us from India with some translations and Olena Jennings and Ali Kinsella will be joining us with um, poetry from the Ukraine. So we will, those will be our featured poets sharing poetry um, in translation in the home languages as well as in English. And we invite all of you out there who are translators or whose poetry has been translators translated to join us on the open mic following our featured readers. What I expect will just be an incredible, incredible um, carnival of voices in many dialects and in many languages um, and from many places. So that will be next Sunday. And then we come back on July 25th um, for our new book showcase, and that will be featuring the work of Carrie Shippers, Tamara Salmon, Max Sanderson, who's there on the call with us today, will be joining us from Canada. And why am I blinking on my final reader? Here we go, my final reader for. Mary Gillard, of course, also from New Mexico. So wonderful poets, 
from across the United States and Canada on July 25th. That will round out the month of July. I uh, hope you will stay with us these next two Sundays. And of course, I hope to be back with you live on screen next time. I, I did miss putting all my wacky comments in the chat box, but I'm sure all of you got all the love in the chat that you needed without my comments. <laughs> a reminder to register for all of our readings on our events pages. Feel free to share them widely with your network. We would love to have folks in our live audience as well as watching us live on our Facebook page. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, of course, as always, to the indomitable Don Krieger, whom I looks like I'm going to get to meet in person for the first time tomorrow, which I'm very excited about. Thank you so much for you being our production wizard. And of course, for our graphics guru, Kim Ports Parsons, who also makes sure that those, um, those, those, um, those book links get out to all of you so that you can add to your fabulous growing collections of poetry. I like to, I kind of, I, I, I've, been, I've been closing out recently by just reminding folks that really our humanity depends on our deep listening of one another. And today I had a wonderful opportunity to deeply listen in a different way than I usually do by being here on the phone with you. Please take very good care of yourselves this week. Take good care of your beloved. And of course, my friends, keep doing what you do so very well, which is writing that exquisite poetry that you, that, that, that all of us are so fortunate to hear from time to time. That's it for today. I look so forward to seeing you next Sunday. Be well, and we'll see you next time.